So hi everyone, I am Megan Garber. Um, I work at the foundation here as an assistant editor at the Neiman Journalism Lab. We are a collaborative effort to report on news innovation and to essentially try to figure out the future of journalism. Uh, so today, this is our last panel of the day. I have a fun but also sort of doubly intimidating task. Uh, first, I have to follow Bill Keller. Um, and second, I am introducing a session that has a very broad and somewhat intimidating heading. Um, on the schedule, you all have the 2.30 section of today's proceedings is called The Future of Transparency, uh, which is a huge idea, I think, in any context. Um, so the six of us um, here will try to frame that a bit, try to take some of the sort of capital T, capital F, uh, bigness out of the idea of the future and really look to where things stand at the present moment um, as sort of tentative evidence about what's to come for journalism and especially as that relates to ideas of openness and transparency. Uh, so we will try to do that through the prism of entrepreneurship, which is one of the themes that um, a lot of the panelists today I'll share. Uh, through considering some of the models that move journalism beyond a loose collective of traditional news organizations and towards something that's more atomized, um, but also at the same time, I think, more collaborative. Um, I think one of the things we're finding with WikiLeaks and with the universe of media more generally is that technology can be really determinative. Uh, the new tools that we're developing, which include new technologies, definitely, but also include new systems and new infrastructures of information production, are laying the foundation for what journalism will become in the future. Uh, so with all that in mind, and again for the last session today, we have a group of panelists who are really at the forefront of figuring out what our new tools will be. Uh, they're journalists who embody a really intriguing and I think exciting combination of traditional news gathering backgrounds um, and also experimentation with new approaches to collecting and framing and disseminating information. So I'm really happy to have them with us today. Um, I'll introduce them very quickly um, so that we can get to the talking and that so you guys can have a lot of time um, to talk with them and ask your questions. Uh, so first off, um, over in the corner here, and we will move up, I think, after um, some presentations, uh, we have Bill Allison. Bill is the editorial director of the Sunlight Foundation. Um, I'm figuring if you guys are in this room and excited about transparency that you're familiar with Sunlight, but uh, essentially they're an organization dedicated to fostering greater government transparency and, open and openness, um, and particularly through new technologies. Um, Bill is also a veteran investigative reporter and editor, and he's written and edited several books, among them The Cheating of America, The Buying of the President 2000, and The Buying of the President 2004. So welcome, Bill. Um, we also have uh, John Bohannon. Are you in the room? Excellent. Hello. Uh, John is a contributing correspondent for Science Magazine, where he writes about everything from molecular biology to archaeology. He also works with multimedia narrative. Um, if I can highlight one of my personal favorites of John's work, he uh, recently partnered with Isabella Rossellini, and that is the Isabella Rossellini, um, to create a series of short films, Animals Distract Me and Green Porno, uh, which is a series that features Rossellini, um, and here I'm going to quote from a write-up on SundanceChannel.com, as she acts out the reproductive habits of marine animals and insects in a way that's both scientifically accurate and extremely entertaining. Uh, the series justifiably went viral online and I think is a great example of how new tools can help journalists find compelling new ways of engaging the public around information um, and also of adding new dimensions to storytelling. So thank you, John, for being here. Uh, we also have David Kaplan. Uh, David is the director of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which is a network of some 100 reporters that's sponsored by the Center for Public Integrity. ICIJ has journalists in 50 countries and is a great model of the new form of network journalism that relies on collaboration to maximize journalism's impact. ICIJ is dedicated to investigating cross-border crime and corruption um, and actually really to accountability journalism in general. Um, on really a global scale as well. Um, and it uses new tools like computer-assisted reporting and data mining in producing that journalism. Uh, before joining ICIJ, David was the chief investigative correspondent for US News and World Report, where he covered transnational crime and terrorism. He's also an author, and one of his books, Yakuza, is widely regarded to be the definitive work on organized crime in Japan. So welcome, David. Um, and then we have Taro Koyama um, in the back there, um, 
who is a photographer who has spent most of the past 10 years reporting on conflict and humanitarian crises. He's reported in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kashmir, and Iraq, uh, traveling both independently and also as an embedded reporter with military forces. Uh, the images he's captured have appeared in publications like Time, Newsweek, Outside, and National Geographic. And then for our purposes on a more uh, explicitly entrepreneurial level, uh, Taru is a co-founder of Lightstalkers.org, which is an online network of photographers, filmmakers, journalists, and members of the military and NGO communities. Uh, earlier this year, Teru won a Night News Challenge grant to fund Basecamp.org, which is an experimental project that uses social media to track a battalion of Marines deployed in Afghanistan. A very, very cool project. Uh, so welcome, Teru. Um, and then finally, last but not least, we have Aaron Pilhofer. Aaron is the editor of Interactive News Technologies at the New York Times, where he leads a team of journalist developers who build data-driven applications to enhance the Times' reporting. Um, so basically, if you've seen a very cool um, interactive on the Times' website, Aaron most likely had something to do with it. Uh, then in his spare time, Aaron works on a project called Document Cloud, which you'll hear more about later today. Uh, essentially, it's an uh, interactive repository of primary source documents and a tool for document-based investigative reporting. Um, it's just a wonderful resource for precisely the type of investigative and accountability journalism that we've been talking about today. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, we're excited to have you scattered about the room and to have you soon um, before us up on the stage. So uh, we'll get started. I think, are we starting, Teru, are we starting yeah, with you? Yeah. Okay, awesome, come on up, thanks. Okay, so I should just do that. Yeah. This is mine? Uh, yeah, yes. Hello, hello. Okay. Um, sorry, that was me before, really rudely chatting on a sat on a mobile phone in the back. But I'm going to Afghanistan on Monday, and I'm really desperately trying to get a satellite modem and some sat phones uh, sent uh, to me before I head out. So, um, sorry. Um, so, the project that I'm working on now it's called Base Track. Um, Base Track is actually the name that we've given to the sort of underlying operating system. It's uh, it's an open source. Uh, system. It's built on WordPress um, and then also to the methodology that we're using to sort of um, transmit the information through social media. Um, as was mentioned, um, the um, project tracks a battalion of Marines in southern Afghanistan. The web crew really likes this like graphic stuff where it zooms in and out. It's cool. Um, <laughs> um, and we've got a team roughly of about 11, uh, 12 people who uh, work in different capacities. There's three photographers who rotate in and out um, with, the, um, with the Marines. Um, and we've got some writers going in next. Um, and a couple of analysts from the region who kind of uh, pump in news that from, from, from there. Oh, what's this? Oh, another Zoom, great. Anyway, that's where we are. It's uh, Helmand. Uh, we're around an area called Musakala, and um, we are basically f following about a thousand Marines. That's a b battalion is roughly a thousand Marines. These guys are actually 1,300 when they have their attachments with them, um, and we're chronicling their deployment from start to finish. Um, this is the website, um, and uh, I guess in new media speak, it's a com combination of aggregated news and original reporting. When I first started talking to the Marines about this, I asked where they were getting their news and where the families of the Marines were getting their news, and the answer was mostly Fox News. So one of the first things we built was uh, um, this Afghanistan news feed, which scrapes uh, um, reporting from a lot of uh, different sources, including regional sources. This is basically how the site works. It's um, built on a timeline and uh, a mapping system. So posts are uh, basically uh, tagged to a, a chronology and also to their location. So anyway, this is basically what it looks like. 
Um, but this is actually basically where, where all the action is. And um, we're using Facebook as a way of interfacing with the audience. And uh, the audience is, uh, it's, it's a very small core audience. And it is primarily the immediate families of these Marines. So um, there's a lot of mothers, girlfriends, and wives on this. Um, and um, they're very active. They, um, if we disappear for a few days, they, they post stuff. Um, but this is kind of a, a meeting point where our crew, who are people who have basically been following um, the situation in Afghanistan and Pakistan for a long time, every time we see something in the news that we think is interesting, we push it through here. And um, the idea is that these family members who are originally, at least, predominantly coming to this site to look at pictures of their kids um, also um, encounter um, some information that basically we'd like to arm them with. Um, and so, I mean, this is basically what it comes down to. It's sort of an experiment. And I call it an experiment rather than a publication or an organization. Um, but one of the goals is to see what is the social graph of a 1,000 Marines and how many layers of Facebook could you transmit through through, the, through this immediate core family around them. And um, anyway, I guess one of the, the reason I'm here now is to talk about a piece of this project, which we're just rolling out and wasn't something we intended to do at first. Um, but early on, the command of this uh, Marine Battalion expressed a concern that because we we're going to have so many people with them constantly releasing so much information on uh, a constant basis, they were concerned that inadvertently we might release uh, information that would compromise their security. Um, so we started basically letting them see the stuff, letting them see photographs before we publish them. And one of the things that realized very quickly was that almost none of the um, photographs that they had problems with had anything to do with operational security. It's, it was just image stuff or PR stuff or in a case like this, you know, this 22-year-old's uh, mustache is uh, not quite regulation Marine Corps uh, uh, standard and it should probably be like a little tighter and, you know, he's got some smudges on his face and um, it, it, it was a lot of stuff like this. Um, and I would point out to these uh, to the commanders that you know this actually got nothing to do with operational security, um, and their response was, well, you know, anything that causes us any kind of stress um, impairs our operational security. So, you know, at that point, I thought rather than getting into an endless battle over semantics about what constitutes operational security or doesn't, let's try something different. And I mean. The whole idea of um, blocking this operational security, uh, compromising information comes down to a, a technique called denial of information. Basically, you don't want enemy forces to be able to glean little bits of information and put them together and use them against um, your forces. So um, we've built the denial of information tool. And this is how it works, basically. Um, a post is made, you know, the photos, text, video, et cetera. And then it goes into a redaction system. And the uh, military gets a designated sensor who has a free hand to block out anything that they don't like. And um, part of this, too, was uh, I was actually became interested in seeing, like, what does your version of reality look like? Or what, is, what, what does the world that you would like it to be look like? And uh, so once they log into the system, uh, they get a menu of the posts that are waiting for them. They get access to the text. And they can basically highlight anything they have a problem with and delete it, or actually not delete it. Um, and what happens uh, when they do that? Pop-up window asks them for justification. The, the reason why the information is being redacted. And they can redact as much as they want. Every time they do, they get the same pop-up window.
The text was easy. Dealing with photographs was a little more complicated, but we built them this thing too. Basically, they can just click and drag, <laughs> block stuff out, then same thing. Uh, go explain yourself. And it works for the captions. Uh, Video and, and audio was a little more complex. Uh, we basically just didn't have the resources to make something really specifically where you could um, blot out individual pieces. So we basically uh, just made it an on-off switch. So if there's something in a video or an audio clip that they don't like, you just turn the whole thing off and same thing. Uh, enter their uh, reason for, for doing such. goes to this place, and then once it's uh, ready to go, and this is the way it gets published. So whoever is reading the post can actually see exactly what's been removed, and they also get these scroll over windows that pop up with an explanation. You get the picture. So we just actually just got this online. So uh, we've had it tested once. We know it works. And um, now the question is, it, you know, the ball is in their court now. You know, but they have all the options, I think, that we could possibly give them. You, uh, you can let it publish. You can remove anything you want. Um, and, uh, and uh, you just have to take responsibility for it. Um, and uh, it's been kind of interesting because I think it's been two weeks now where nothing has moved. So I think uh, the actual act of um, having to uh, articulate a reason why something's problematic is actually, I, I, don't, I, you know, I don't know whether that's, that's a barrier or whether <laughs> Um, you know, they're just real tied up with something else right now. But um, it, I'm actually really curious to see where this goes because uh, there seems to suddenly be a lot less enthusiasm for, for um, holding back images. Um, and I'm hoping in a way that this, you know, solves all our problems and, uh, you know, basically you make the choice how you want to deal with this, you know. Let it, let it publish as it is, or remove anything that you want and explain it. So that's it. That's the system. Shoot. Sorry. <laughs> OK. You need something. <laughs> something is being redacted, it can sort of retroactively after it's sort of, you know, if it's time sensitive, then later it can come back on. Is that what the technology is? Yeah, involves? I mean, yeah. you know, uh, you can see the justification. If it says something like uh, <laughs> this, uh, this uh, text reveals our, the, lo the location that we're about to travel to next, mm -hmm. once, once, the, once the unit is in that location, it's no longer... Uh, it's the, the, the reason no longer holds, and so um, the redaction could be removed. Um, and actually, um, the battalion has been um, very clear that they're <laughs> only concerned about this while the battalion is deployed. You know, once the battalion comes back, um, you know, they have no problem with, uh, with, uh, with the uh, information being shown. So, yeah, at a certain point, people will actually see make a comparison between uh, the original and the redacted version and uh, see what they Speak make. Speak into the microphone. Oh. oh. Um, yeah, I was saying, uh, Stephanie was asking, uh, 
you know, what's the time frame of the reaction? And the reaction, you know, it would depend on, say, a, a situation where if uh, information is being redacted because it might compromise a future operation or a position where the Marines might be going to, once that aspect is, is, is moot, once the Marines are in that position, once the operation is over, uh, there's no need for it to, to be redacted anymore. And uh, the commanders of the, of the battalion have actually been pretty clear that they're only concerned about this while um, the Marines are deployed. Um, and uh, you know, once, once they're safely back home, this isn't a problem for them. So that's how, you know, that, that's, that's the system. I mean, I don't know how that works for um, mustaches that are, you know, beyond regulation or things like that, but um, for things that are uh, operational security concerns, like, uh, I think, think, think that works. Hi, I'm uh, Bill Allison. I'm the editorial director at the Sunlight Foundation. For those of you who don't know, uh, Sunlight has been around for about four years. We're a government transparency organization. Um, we're somewhat distinct from an organization like WikiLeaks. What we're trying to do is create um, legal structures, requirements for government to release more data to the public and make it more available to citizens. Uh, an example of that is um, uh, one of the very first things we did actually was get involved in uh, congressional earmarks. Up until 2007, Congress didn't release any of this information in one place. These are pet projects that members of Congress sponsor, uh, the Bridge to Nowhere in Alaska being one of the most famous ones, but there are, are I think, like 6,000 earmarks in the latest Senate omnibus. But anyway, uh, because of groups like Sunlight, we're one of several that uh, push for this, Congress started releasing this information in a format, and this is how Taxpayers for Common Sense puts it out as a spreadsheet. One of Sunlight's other goals is to make this more accessible to average citizens. And so what we did is we took uh, that data from Taxpayers from Common Sense and put it on Google Earth. And each one of those little pins represents a, a project somewhere in a member's district. Uh, if you had Google Earth and could zoom in on this, uh, a member of Congress called us and said, uh, I want to see how you fly over the earmarks. Uh, and that's exactly what it's like. But you can actually zoom in down to the level of a building and see where one of these projects, you know, a million dollars to make no drip transmission plans for Huey helicopters and whatnot. And you can kind of follow these all over the country. Um, we took the same concept and started doing it with a lot of other kinds of federal data. For example, we took federal contracts and put them on, uh, this is uh, obviously California, showing where federal spending was going on in states from data from usaspending.gov. Uh, we provided a lot more contextual information about members of Congress who were very interested in influence data. And in fact, what we started to do was bring together all kinds of different influence data, lobbying records, campaign finance records from the original sources, from grantees of ours like Center for Responsive Politics, which does um, um, campaign finance records and lobbying records and all kinds of other things, earmarks and whatnot. And what we try to do is make this available to users in a very, very friendly way that could be spread all over the web. This was PolitiWidgets. Um, and it, what it does is give you kind of up to the minute information on members of Congress from all these different sources. And somewhat, uh, most importantly, we want it to be contextual. So here's my representative from Congress, uh, Jim Moran, who's one of the Appropriations Committee members. And you can see from this little widget that he uh, was granted 83 earmarks compared to 20 for the average member of Congress, how much money that was worth, and if you click on uh, the little, there's a little source tag, which probably doesn't quite come through on this uh, slide. Uh, if you click on that information, it'll take you back to the original source. You can see all of the individual earmarks. Uh, and this was, we made these as easy to embed in a YouTube video. It was like 100 different newspapers around the country used it in the run-up to the 2010 midterm elections. Um, so that was, uh, that was one way that we tried to get this information out. We've also gotten interested in mobile apps. One of our very first ones is we took recovery.gov data and put it on an iPhone so people could walk around and see. This is a shot from Washington, D.C., and this is actually mostly lobbying firms uh, because the application this works on, um, it's specific to the geographic area where you are. And the person who, um, when we made these slides, uh, we're in D.C. That's the left is actually right outside of our office. Um, and you can kind of see where the recovery contracts are. And we also have proprietary data, including 
uh, a site called Party Time where um, people leak us invitations to fundraisers for members of Congress. And uh, we took all of that and we put that on an iPhone app. And you can walk around Washington at night and see where the <laughs> fundraisers are taking place. And as a, you can kind of really read it on the slide, we've got offices of DLA Piper, Rudnick, Gray, uh, Gray Carey, and so on, Aitman, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld. So you can kind of see where these things are happening in DC. A lot of them are at restaurants, though. There's a Spezia Ristorante. Um, so OK, so while we're uh, focusing on this kind of influence data in Congress and whatnot, we have the Obama administration come in. They talk about how they're going to have this open government data. They're going to make much more government data available, which, of course, is music to our ears releasing high-value data, and I put throat clearing there because we haven't seen very much high-value data yet. Uh, but Sunlight started to ask what we could do with it. Uh, we went to the Knight Foundation, who have been very generous and given us a second grant to build public-facing apps and try to get this data to uh, citizens in a way that will be helpful to them or useful to them. Um, so the very first one we're working on is, uh, I call it Brand Muffins. This is an inside joke. Everything that the, our technology team does is named after um, meat products. So everything that the reporting group does is named after baked goods. Um, anyway, so we figured we were going to do healthcare data. And it's really very simple. Find great data that fits together. Uh, get the data. Uh, work with our partners to refine what we're going to do with it. And then make something really cool which isn't quite as easy as it sounds. There is no shortage of data, and MedicareData.gov and the uh, Department of Health and Human Services is putting out a ton of data. Uh, they have a, a porthole for doing this. They have, um, uh, they've issued a challenge to developers to build apps from their data. Um, but the approach is, if you think about this and how to make this really interesting for citizens or useful for citizens, and especially in a, a journalistically relevant way, uh, this is something called Hospital Compare. It's an iPhone app that somebody already makes, and it takes data straight from um, Medicare data, from Centers for Medicare Services. And this is what it kind of shows you. And you can see um, what the average payment is for a heart attack with major complications in different hospitals in your area, um, people who report that the room is always clean. And in some ways, this is really good. And again, it's the data straight from the agency. But I'm thinking that if I'm in a ambulance having a heart attack, I'm probably not going to have my iPhone out trying to figure out who has the cleanest sheets. So we started trying to think of other ways to, to handle this. This is another approach. This is county health rankings. I believe this is, um, I know I've forgotten already, I think it's Kaiser that's doing this. And they give you all kinds of county health data. You can break down, you know, how many people in my hometown of Lancaster, PA, um, you know, everything from falling off of ladders to heart disease to cancer. Uh, what the mortality rate is overall, the morbidity rate. Uh, it's fantastic stuff. And like what being a data hound, like I would love this on an iPhone app, but I don't know that most people would be as interested in this, um, and despite all the different metrics that they have. Uh, so is this the, the really good data? Is this the really interesting stuff? And this is one of the big problems we have when we're dealing with the government and trying to get data. Uh, this is a group called RESDAC, or the Research Data Assistance Center. And this is one of the big problems we run into with open government information. This is a contractor that works with CMS and handles Medicare data, and it's patient-specific data. There is information in here. If you're on Medicare, your name is in their files, or you ever filed a claim. Um, you can do amazing stuff with this information. This is a Wall Street Journal story where they got ResDAC data. It took them a long time to get, and it's very expensive to get information from them. But they were able to identify by drilling down into this data. For example, they uh, begin this story in a fantastic way talking about a doctor that they've identified who is most likely guilty of Medicare fraud based on the pattern of billing that she does. And then they also add that the Wall Street Journal is prohibited from naming this doctor under an agreement that they reached with ResDAC when they started getting this information. Um, and one of the reasons why they probably made that agreement is it is very difficult to get uh, information from them. When I think of a Freedom of Information Act request, I want to send it to the agency, wait an internally long period of time. but. Uh, and then I want to get it back. This is the flow chart for what you have to do to get data from ResDAC. And it begins with you send something to them, they send it back to you, you send it back to them, they send it back to you, they send it to CMS, which sends it back to you or back to them. And it's just like, you know, this is, uh, it is a complicated process to get data from them. Um, one of the things is, and of course it costs a lot of money, but one of the things about that, uh, it also doesn't, also very difficult to get pricing information uh, from them. 
Uh, and when you think about it, this is one of the things that we were talking about in terms of doing um, you know, the app that would really be useful. If you could take how much your drugs cost, mash it together with Consumer Reports, which does all kinds of information on the types of uh, drug reactions and, and comp comparative effectiveness of, effectiveness of drugs, rating them within classes, uh, and ProPublica, what they've done, and this will be under the health care bill, will be uh, released to the public in a much better format, we hope. Uh, but did your doctor take money from a particular pharmaceutical company? Um, if you can get all of that and together on an iPhone app, so you get your prescription, you plug in the information, you see, gee, is this the best drug, and is my doctor getting, uh, you know, did he just take a cruise to the Bahamas to talk about whatever particular prescription he's um, uh, prescribed me? That would be a useful thing for people to have. But there's a big problem with this, and that's that getting data from ResDAC is really hard, and getting information on the prescriptions is really hard because in a lot of areas or a lot of places or a lot of different types of drugs, uh, and th the patient information is part of it, so for them to clean out all the patient information, for them to provide it to you in a way that you're not going to compromise anyone's privacy, um, is very difficult to get that information from them. Uh, and, you know, there's an example of this that we did a story on uh, early on when the government released USAspending.gov, one of the agencies, and they probably started doing this in the 1960s, the file numbers that they had for each person who got these particular types of agriculture loans, part of it was their social security number. So you have the U.S. government publishing social security numbers online as part of the spending database. Somebody noticed it. They contacted uh, uh, OMB Watch, which is a grannies of ours that did fedspending.org, which is kind of a precursor to usaspending.gov. And, uh, and that's how we found out about it. And they had to pull down all of this data because it gave out this privacy information. Um, and so I'm going to stop there, and uh, we'll switch on to the next person. Um, hi, I'm Aaron Pilhofer. I'm editor of Interactive News at the New York Times. Um, I'm wearing two hats today because, obviously, I'm sure, based on the panels to uh, this point, there will be some questions about WikiLeaks, and most certainly um, it's expected that probably the New York Times will come up in that context. We did actually work on, on, that, on that project, so I can talk about it a little bit on the tech side. I'm here to talk a bit about Document Cloud. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about what it is, how it works. I'll just give you a quick overview because, frankly, in the context of, of this conversation that we've been having today, I'm actually a lot more interested in some of the, um, some of the, the, the sorts of things that the whole WikiLeaks uh, project, in particular, the, 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 the legal aspects of it, have kind of raised around um, an idea like this one. So first, let me tell you what it is. The idea is it's a night-funded project. Um, the idea was to create a free site for journalists to help them um, analyze, um, um, share, annotate, and then ultimately publish um, source documents. Obviously, document-based reporting is key to uh, virtually everything we do as reporters. Um, and until this point, really, how have we done document-based reporting? Usually it's sitting around with a highlighter and a yellow legal pad. And see, every time I, met, every time I say that, there's about five people in the audience who start smiling because you know I tell the truth. This is the, this is the technology that we have out. There it is. David Kaplan has one in his hand, a yellow legal pad. He is doing document-based reporting right now. So what Document Cloud does is you can upload your documents to us. We will OCR them if, it's, if, you do not have, if they're not text readable. Um, uh, optical character recognition will take a non-searchable uh, document and make it searchable. Um, a document, once it's in Document Cloud, looks a little like this. Here it is. This is a beautiful piece of software that, that my team at the Times wrote. Sorry, I use Macs, so I'm going to fumble. Um, uh, we, once a document is in Document Cloud, we also run it through a service called Open Calais. And what Open Calais does is it takes that unstructured text, that um, the text that we've either extracted or that's already in that document. And it goes through and it finds these key elements, people, places, um, organizations. And you can see what that looks like. Here I'll click on, this is obviously a demo account. I don't do a lot of gardening, but so you, just to give you an idea, here's some of the people that it pulled out of these documents, some of the organizations you can filter in on, on those like so. You can, 
I'm sorry, this is really hard to see. There it is. And you, you can drill right into the page where that's, where that's referenced, right? So you can already see if you're reporting or doing a lot of document-based reporting how useful this might be. What's really amazing about Open Calais is it does this through a series of rules. So it goes through and it tries to determine, it sees maybe a three, three characters in a document, CIA. And it can tell whether CIA refers to the Culinary Institute of America or whether the, it refers to the Central Intelligence Agency through these rules. Is it perfect? No. But right now, what are we using? Yellow legal pad, highlighter, okay? So compare these two things. Any time, if, even if it gets it wrong, 14 out of 15 times, that one reference gives you a key that makes that document a hit instead of a miss. What's even cooler about this is once it references this and says, okay, this is the Central Intelligence Agency, you can link those things together. So now if you've ever done any database reporting where you have several different databases coming together in different tables and you can sort of join those, you know, school bus drivers and say DWI convictions, things like that, and you want to kind of join them together, maybe based on name or social security number, you can start to do that kind of thing with documents now. So that's what Document Cloud is. Um, we are built, this whole thing is sitting on the cloud. This thing is on, is on Amazon.com, and yes, I'm going to take my second computer and move that up here. Um, and why is that important? WikiLeaks was on Amazon.com as well. So actually, I'm sort of more interested in the Q&A, talking less about WikiLeaks and talking more about Amazon, um, Napster, LimeWire, um, iTunes, and BitTorrent about some of these other technologies that I think actually are more applicable to a conversation about technology and journalism than um, some of the things that we're talking about, than, than even maybe WikiLeaks or Julian Assange as an individual might be right now. So let me just read to you really quickly what, the, um, what Amazon said when they pulled down WikiLeaks. Amazon said, quote, um, you, uh, the rule, the, the, the terms of service that they violated, that was the basis on which Amazon shut the account down. Um, that they, they violated the terms of service, and the term that they violated, among the ones that they said they violated, are, quote, that you, the user, represent and warrant that you own or otherwise control all the rights to the content, that use of this content you supply does not violate this policy and will not cause injury to any person or entity, okay? So for that first trove of documents that they got so much um, uh, criticism for, you had individuals named, that, that's a pretty much of a no-brainer on the second part of that clause. But what about the first part of that? That you own or represent or warrant that you otherwise control all of the rights to that content. How many documents do reporters get on a daily basis where you can make that claim? Um, either through uh, FOIA or, or more importantly, having those documents leaked to you. So as an organization, technologically, WikiLeaks as the source of these documents, that can easily be handled. You can pull them down off of Amazon. Um, WikiLeaks in this sense, and I'm gonna make this analogy now, is sort of the Napster, right? If you all remember way back when, when we were talking about music sharing and people who were uh, trading music illegally, Napster was kind of the WikiLeaks of music sharing in a sense because um, it was a central server. All the music sort of went through one place. And as a result, they were very easy to sort of for the record companies to go after and shut down. So what happened after, after Napster? There was a number of other services that kind of cropped up that were semi-decentralized, also slightly more difficult to shut down. Then something like called BitTorrent sort of came up. Do you all remember BitTorrent? BitTorrent was a piece of software, is a piece of software. It's still in use. Actually, WikiLeaks uses it, uh, among others to share documents, to share any kind of data among users without having to have a single central repository uh, anywhere. And uh, so basically anybody can be both a consumer of, of data or a distributor of data. Every node can be um, a distributor or a consumer of data. And that's where I think this is headed. Okay, so we can talk about WikiLeaks and we can talk about the future of WikiLeaks and we can talk about Julian Assange, but from a technology standpoint, this is the direction things are heading. And even if WikiLeaks shut down tomorrow, to my mind, the future is BitTorrent, it's not WikiLeaks, just as the future of music sharing uh, was BitTorrent and not Napster. Now all the record companies will look at you and go and say, thank God for iTunes. I don't really see an iTunes for leaked documents cropping up anytime soon, 
But only because of iTunes are we not talking about all the problems of BitTorrent right now. Um, I guess that's pretty much where I want to leave it. So I want to leave a lot of time for Q&A. And I never did get, a, get a, anything. See? See? How about that? Right on time. Thanks very much. Well, no, I was I have two minutes. I'm up, right? Uh, Stephanie, it's me now. Is it me now? Oh, is it Kaplan now? Hi, everybody. I, I promised I, I would go low tech today because there were so many PowerPoint. I love doing PowerPoints, but that's 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 all right. Yeah, can we? Uh, uh, I, I hate to get rid of Aaron's handiwork here. Um, look at this hard copy. This is, uh, this is really my low tech day. Um, I, I'm privileged to direct something called the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. ICIJ is the international wing of the Center for Public Integrity, based in Washington, D.C. Did the next guy have a PowerPoint? Uh -oh. Okay, good, good. Um, anyway, th th this has been a, a really nice gathering, and, and just a thank you to our hosts and, and uh, all the hard work that goes into these. Having been on the other side, I'm very, very appreciative. Um, so the center is based in Washington. We're one of the, the oldest, one of the original uh, nonprofit centers that specializes in investigative journalism. ICIJ uh, was founded, as was the center, by, by Chuck Lewis, really one of the, the, the great innovators in, in uh, uh, modern journalism. Uh, Chuck foresaw that there was a, a need for, for an international version of, of a, a nonprofit center and that it needed to be network based. Now, bear in mind, this is 1997, so the World Wide Web hadn't really come in, into its, its own yet. Uh, but all of the, 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 the impacts of globalization, you could, you could feel at that point. You know, the, because of the, the crumbling of the Berlin Wall, borders had come down, travel was fairly cheap, people could move around, around the world, uh, mobile phones had come forward, and, and, uh, 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 and, and computers were revolutionizing how we use information, communications were changing. So you really could see there was something uh, uh, truly dynamic and unprecedented that, that was, was going on. But politically, th there was something else that was, that was happening that I think Chuck recognized, and, and it's that we really inhabit two, two different worlds. Now, much of the conversation today about secrecy and journalism has focused about, uh, uh, about government. And, and someone brought up in one of the morning sessions, what about, what about corporations? What about the private sector? So I'm going to tailor my remarks a bit to that because they're often the, the, the subjects of ICIJ's reporting. ICIJ today has uh, more than 100 leading reporters, reporters who are quite distinguished in their home countries in, in 50 different nations around the world. And, and we're, we're, we're growing. We're, uh, um, uh, we do three big projects a year. We do a number of smaller ones. We, we have a very active uh, uh, online community. Our Facebook uh, following is nearly 7,000. I think it's the largest uh, social networking community on investigative reporting. Um, and a lot of, as I said, a lot of what we look at is sort of this dark side of the world. There, there, there really are two worlds, this legitimate and legal society where you have the rule of law and, and, and an above ground economy. And then there's this whole mirror imaged economy uh, that is illegitimate, full of illicit trade, that's ruled by crime and corruption, payoffs, political fixes, offshore financial centers. Uh, uh, off the books translation, uh, transactions, not translations. So you can see where my head is at with all this. Uh, uh, warlords, kleptocrats, mob bosses, uh, a lot of the, the companies we look at would qualify uh, under what U.S. racketeering law calls a cr continuing criminal enterprise. Uh, the, this world is huge. Uh, uh, the, there's, uh, there are estimates of $1 trillion to $3 trillion about how much is laundered uh, around the world each, each year. That's in the range of the collective GDP of, of Africa or Latin America. And even that doesn't tell the story. About two-thirds of uh, uh, 
uh, of Africa's entire economy is off the books. So when you're talking about the, 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 the trade in resources and, and talking about how, how uh, wh what happens to, to tax revenue and, and, and uh, uh, where does all this money go? Who is following these trails of money and people and accountability? Although the fact is that there, there are very few vehicles out there. The, the, the cops don't have the jurisdiction. They often don't have the resources. Uh, financial regulators tell you they have the same problem. And we in the media have, have uh, 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 a similar problem. Uh, there, there, there's this global lack of accountability uh, where people are able to act with, with impunity. Um, um, and this is accelerated because of all these technologies that have globalized the world. Um, uh, so where are we left? You know, it's one of the great ironies that at a time of unprecedented information uh, overload, we're losing our, our eyes and ears around the world. Uh, we need more accurate, in-depth news from abroad as never before. But it, it, as everyone knows, serious journalism is in in dire straits. Uh, I think it's been touched on here. Uh, U.S. journalism, U.S. newsrooms have lost 20,000 jobs in the last 15 or, or so years. And the foreign bureaus and the investigative teams were the first to go. Bloggers and citizen journalists simply can't make up for the loss of an entire generation of seasoned correspondents who know how to dig, contextualize, and stick to the facts. Uh, doing quality investigative reporting has always been a challenge, even here in the U.S. That there never were any good old days. We've always had to fight to get our stories in. Uh, 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 there's always been, been, you know, threats from lawsuits and from penny-pinching owners. Uh, and today, of course, the, the challenges are, are much more acute. Uh, shifting economic model for news, changing technology, fleeting attention spans, a uh, bruising recession. And we have it easy. Now, if you move all this overseas, you have a, a, an entirely new set of problems operating internationally. Differences in language, culture, professional standards, libel laws. Then throw in a bunch of more mundane headaches like time differences, access to, to good communications. Finally, figure out how to finance a, a, a six-month bout of multinational muckraking. Well, that's what we do. ICIJ is, is one small attempt to, to, to help even the playing field. We're not big. I have a staff of seven in Washington. We, we have a, a, a membership that, that is by invitation of about 100 reporters, as I said. And then we have a, a network of several hundred associates around the world. You might have heard of some of our past work. Uh, uh, we. Uh, uh, I think we first got on the map around 2000, 2001, showing how multinational, five minutes, okay, okay, okay. Uh, showing how multinational corporations, uh, t tobacco companies have, uh, uh, had engaged with organized crime to smuggle tobacco around the world. Uh, we revealed how a once, uh, how a then obscure company named Halliburton had topped the, the uh, 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 contractors list in Iraq and Afghanistan reported on arms traffickers, water profiteers, politicization of foreign aid. Uh, there's a couple um, this year that I'm particularly proud of. We, we did one series on, uh, um, uh, on how the asbestos industry has targeted developing countries. Asbestos is now banned in, in Western Europe and, uh, and, and it's, it's barely used here in the States. Um, so the industry has spent uh, as much as $100 million marketing its product worldwide, particularly to places like China and, and India, where we found conditions were just abhorrent. Um, uh, again, who's going to put together teams to do these stories? Uh, the, the other one we did was, was on the black market in bluefin tuna. Bluefin tuna is uh, uh, the world's most coveted source of, of premium sushi. We documented with a 10-country team how uh, there's, the, there's a $4 billion black market, and it's been going on for a decade, uh, and the system has failed at virtually every level. Um, and, um, okay. Um, our ability to do these, these stories is, is uh, uh, supported by a much broader network. There are about 60 investigative nonprofit groups and associations worldwide. 
And, and uh, many of those, like, like Stefan Kandea from the Romanian Center, are, are, are members, others we, we work with in, in Bosnia, in the Philippines, in Chile. Uh, most of these groups have formed since 2000, and it, it's very exciting what, what's going on. Uh, this is really the network-based journalism at its best, and it's, it's been fueled by a handful of grants, a bunch of training conferences, and, and a lot of volunteer work by journalists all over the world. Uh, we do this by utilizing what's best uh, both about the present and the past. Uh, we create these virtual teams. We link them by email, by mobile phones. We use collaborative software. Uh, we, uh, you know, we love all the new technology folks. Um, uh, Computer-assisted reporting, spreadsheets, database programs. As I said, we have a big social media site for security. We use anonymizing software and encryption when we have to. Uh, all that is great, but, but I guess what I want to leave this group with is that none of this replaces good old-fashioned reporting. The best tools we still use come from 100 years ago, from the original muckrakers, from people like, like Ida Tarbell and, and Lincoln Steffens. you got to get out and do the reporting. None of these stories I talked about, bluefin tuna or asbestos or, 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 or um, tobacco industry, would be possible sitting at a terminal. Uh, uh, nothing replaces the careful craft of developing great sources, building trust, and observing firsthand what's happening in this big, bad world. Investigative reporting takes time. I mean, it took us weeks even to know what, what questions to ask on, on the tuna story. Um, uh, it's also dangerous. Two minutes. Okay. I've got, I've got three minutes, though. <laughs> uh, this gentleman cedes his minutes to me here. Is that okay? <laughs> no, yeah, I guess he doesn't. Okay. Um, uh, to do uh, to, to document this four billion dollar black market, we checked court records in Algeria and Croatia. We interviewed fishermen on the docks of France and Tunisia sea ranch uh, hands in Spain and Malta, executives in, 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 uh, at Tokyo companies and bureaucrats at offices in Madrid, Brussels, and, and Washington. You know, Bill Keller mentioned, uh, you know, are we entering a, hacker and for a, a new era of hacker and forced transparency, which I thought was a great phrase. Well, I don't think so. It's still going to take really good reporters to get out into the field and get French fishermen to describe on the record how they laundered fish for a decade. That's what our reporters did. Um, WikiLeaks, I think, is essentially leak journalism on steroids. You know, it's, it's, it's a useful tool. It's, it's, it's great for transparency and whistleblowing. It's not investigative journalism. Uh, and, and uh, you know, leak journalism and, and blogging and, and run-and-gun reporting, these aren't investigative journalism either. You know, if you look up the word investigation in a dictionary, it means in systematic inquiry. It's by definition in-depth. You, you can't do it on, on, on the run. So you need all these great tools. You need all this, the, the, these, the, the, this new technology, but you need to fuse them with an investigator's sense of where the trail leads and who's telling you the truth. And that's not going to change, especially in a world riven by such inequalities in development and wealth and power. In fact, we're going to need that kind of reporting more than ever before. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Bohannon. Uh, before I begin, I just wanted to make sure, before I forget, uh, to put an idea out there, since this is exactly the right audience for it. If you're, uh, so I've heard from many people that one of the advantages of an outfit like WikiLeaks is that it makes it safer to leak, that uh, sources now have a one-stop shop, they can do it remotely, they don't have to knock on any doors, and this is all good from the point of view of potential leakers. Um, there's, there's, there's a technique in cryptography called uh, stenography, where you can essentially conceal something in plain sight. And I just, I think if, if you guys, uh, you know, in the coming years are going to continue the debate about safety of, of leaks, you should consider that um, huge changes are afoot right now in the U.S. government on how digital information is handled. And uh, a real no-brainer would be to 
uh, encode stenographic information in ev every document, you can do it in a way that makes it impossible to share leaked documents without revealing your sources, or at least the computer at which that document was originally leaked. Uh, and essentially, it scales with the size of the leak. The more information that you pull off of, let's say, uh, you know, Bradley Manning's computer, um, the easier it is to identify that that's where it came from. You can do things like, um, essentially, how many spaces are between sentences, uh, how uh, things are spelled, whether or not there uh, are certain punctuation marks, things that are completely invisible to you in, in thousands of pages of documents, but which a, a, an automated system could pull right back out. Do, if you see what I'm getting at, essentially everything that changes hands uh, within the government's uh, computer system could be essentially time and place stamped. So that's really easy to do, especially if you're talking about huge numbers of documents. Um, and there's nothing you can do about that. Imagine having a WikiLeaks uh, 10 years in the future, which was stenographically imprinted. Um, you can't copy and paste it. It's stenographically imprinted. You can't OCR it, because it could be as subtle as the, no the usage of the words. You can't even have someone read it on the radio, because the usage of the words would stenographically geolocate it. You can't even summarize it, probably, because then what have you got? You know, who's, who's going to believe you? You're not really leaking a document if you simply, trust me, I'm going I'm to tell you the gist of the following leaked document, but I can't show you the document. What, do you, what are we going to do then? So uh, having these huge uh, you know, computerized systems that enable leaks is, is great for now, but it, it also could bring us to a time where such leaks are simply impossible with, with, that, with keeping sources uh, private. So just keep that in mind. It's kind of a double-edged sword. I assume it's underway if it isn't already <laughs> in place. Um, it just occurred to me that you know that's a, kind of a no-brainer if you want to prevent future leaks. Anyway, um, enough speculation. So I always feel like an imposter at these gatherings because I'm not really, a, in some sense, a journalist. I, I never trained as a journalist. I'm a scientist, but then uh, became a journalist. Um, but what I found is that increasingly the kind of stories that interest me have the scientific technique in common. The best kind of investigative journalism is like the best kind of science. Um, you, the investigator, uh, don't ask your readers to take your claims at face value. You share the information that you gathered along the way and let them make up, see if they agree with you. That's good science. So. <clears throat> Uh, the other thing is that I found that being a scientific, um, uh, being a journalist imposter, uh, being, a, being essentially a, a scientist who is posing as a journalist, has carried certain advantages. I have sort of waltzed into places like Gaza, Iran, and most recently Afghanistan um, with uh, complete cooperation from the authorities um, because the stories that I seem to be covering are always so feel good. Science is so feel good. You know, I'm going into Gaza to do a story about water. Sounds fine. You know, I'm going to Iran to do a, a conference about religion and science. It's fine. All these things led to rather embarrassing stories, or at least had aspects that were embarrassing, but they just keep on throwing the doors open wide. And I'd like to tell you about my experiences with Afghanistan. I was embedded there in October, and um, I don't, I'm not going to claim that my, my experience is representative. It's an end of one trial, but um, <laughs> the U.S. military U.S.-led military forces there, well, NATO-led, ISAF, it's called, have been incredibly forthcoming. And I, I think I, if there's any take-home message, uh, it is that uh, sometimes if you politely ask for information, large, powerful organizations will give it to you. Um, to my shock, uh, I've been checking my email all day, waiting for the latest in what has become a series of they're not really leaks, are they, if the government itself is, is giving you data that it's never released. But uh, I essentially went there uh, as an embedded, I don't, it doesn't really have a name, but let's call it an embedded data journalist. Uh, I, I was quite open about what I was after. Um, I'm interested in the question of how many people uh, are dying in various wars. It started um, with, uh, since 2006, I've been covering Iraq for the journal Science. The reason that a scientific journalist become interested in questions like these that seem so ostensibly political and non-scientific is that the techniques required to make sense of the information uh, are requiring scientific expertise. It's as simple as that. And uh, the debates 
around how to interpret it uh, require scientific expertise. Uh, the, the example with Iraq was uh, this, this number, 600,000 violent deaths post-2003 U.S. invasion. It's a paper that was published in The Lancet, a very prestigious journal, by a pair of uh, researchers from Johns Hopkins University. And I learned about it, like so many others, uh, actually on This American Life, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, Blumberg did this wonderful profile of this uh, cowboy scientist, Les Roberts, who went into Iraq hiding in the trunk of a car to get the data and uh, did this, what's called a cluster survey. Uh, that's the kind of technique you need to use if you want to know something like, for example, how many people have died uh, in Iraq over a certain period of time due to various causes. Um, the same technique is used, by the way, to get most of the data that you see in the news in this country. Uh, you can't just do, it's not like Sweden, where everyone is on some registry. You actually have to take a subsample of houses, uh, what's called a cluster, and you need to make sure that your clusters are a representative sample of all possible clusters, and, uh, and then you extrapolate, essentially. And there are all kinds of, of complications with this technique um, that are well known, but it is all the more complicated if you're trying to do that in a place like Iraq. So um, that, that's where the number 600,000 violent deaths uh, came from. And uh, I was just so inspired by this that, I, that I, that's what really got me interested in, in this question, which is really a legitimate scientific question. How many people have died of violence, for example, of various kinds? Uh, as a result of, or at least after the start of the U.S.-led invasion? Uh, I say it's a legitimate scientific question because it has an answer. A certain number of people certainly did die violent deaths. When, there is a, when, the, when reality has an answer uh, like that, that you can, use, you can use the tools of science to try and address it. That's, it's a legitimate, that's, that's fair game. Uh, but it's not easy to get. And, um, Essentially, here's, here's, here's a story where a liberal guy like me pursues this story and lets the data um, lead the story. And uh, it turned out to be completely the opposite. Uh, essentially, that number of 600,000 turned out to be wildly off. Um, the study had huge problems. I reported on it for uh, several years. And as a result, one of those researchers was banned from human, <laughs> human subject research. Um, He's still at Hopkins. Les Roberts has gone on to a great job at Columbia. I don't know of any repercussions for him. He hates me. I, I know that. He really hates me. Um, I hope you're listening, Les. Uh, I, I held, it's not personal. Um, so uh, my point here is that it's not easy to find out something as straightforward as how many people have died in a particular place over a particular period of time. Now, Afghanistan is even harder than Iraq. In Iraq, we had essentially uh, several techniques coming from different angles that we could compare. So you had this outfit in London called Iraq Body Count, which was systematically and very carefully comparing media reports of deaths on a daily basis and collating and keeping a tally. All right, so that's media-based um, reporting. That, that'll give you what's safe to say a minimum number of the death toll. All right, there's probably deaths that didn't make it into the media, but th there's your minimum at least. And then the technique that Les Roberts and, and crew used has been replicated by the World Health Organization, the cluster survey. And there you, you knock a door to door and you ask uh, whoever answers the door, has anyone died in this household over the past, they did six years. So if the start, this was in 2006, if the start of the invasion was 2003, then you're going to get a before and after. And that, um, if you know the total size of, or at least can estimate the total size of the population of the country, you can extrapolate out to what is called excess death which is a little philosophical, if you hadn't invaded the country and status quo had been maintained, right? this is the number of people above and beyond that death rate, which is attributable to the invasion. So, but then there's another method, which is perhaps the most valuable, valuable uh, of all, which is just ask soldiers, did you see uh, anyone die today? Um, General Tommy Franks, famously said of the Iraq conflict, we don't do body counts. And uh, people doubted him, but I have come to realize that they essentially didn't. Um, there is no systematic body count protocol in wars until now. And this is what I essentially was going to Afghanistan to report on. Uh, starting two years ago, ISAF, which is the NATO-led coalition forces uh, in Afghanistan, have set up a unit called the Civilian Casualty Tracking Cell. 
And uh, essentially, their job is to comb through the kind of data that uh, you've seen with WikiLeaks, for those of you who've actually seen it, this messy stuff that's being generated from the ground up uh, by soldiers on the ground, uh, minute by minute. I actually was uh, embedded in Kandahar and had access to the, essentially in Hollywood, if you've seen those big rooms, war rooms, where you've got giant computer screens and tons of people at computers and people barking out orders, that's what it actually looks like. And I could actually see that information scrolling up uh, on the screens. And they're red, coded red if there's a casualty. And they have an automated system that essentially uh, causes this section of the 1,000 people you know, to uh, essentially find out how to get that casualty to the nearest hospital. And they do an automatic triage system. Anyway, it's a super interesting story. I can't wait to write about it uh, early next year uh, when I can get my notes in order. But um, all of this is being driven by data. And that data is called CIVCAS, for civilian casualties. It has never been systematically collected before. It's being systematically collected now. And lo and behold, I said, can I have that data? And they said, yes. It, I mean, you know, they were wary at first. They said, what do you want to do with it? You know, where are you coming from? Uh, it's been a long process. It's taken about two months. Um, but I, I have nothing but praise for the public affairs office uh, in Kabul and Kandahar, because they're, they're essentially a journalist's best friend out there. First of all, they, I brought the wrong kind of body armor, and they lent me a pair. Everyone has their own body armor, and you know it's not like there's some closet where you can grab body armor. And so I almost got trapped in the country. It was a miracle that I made it to Kandahar, um, just because uh, you're not allowed to fly in certain military planes without the right kind. Uh, you know, they were just watching out for me nonstop. Uh, but on top of that, they were extremely forthcoming. They were essentially an advocate for me within the system. I would say, look, I, I want this kind of data. Most recently, I was like, uh, you know what I really need to know? How many soldiers are actually in Afghanistan? Um, and, can, and they were like, well, here's the number. Uh, there, there are some reports that are publicly available called the placemat, uh, but they're very rough. Uh, and I said, uh, great, can I have more? They gave me monthly over the past year, you know, down to the single digits. This is the best way I have. And they said, but be careful. It's 2 to 3 percent, uh, you know, are on leave. or you know, That's not the exact number. You know, they, were, they wanted me to get the number right. And I've asked for the number going back as far as they can, and she's working on it. You know, incredibly forthcoming, incredibly helpful. So I, I just want to say, yay, Wik WikiLeaks, all this, it's good in some ways. But keep in mind that sometimes you can just politely ask. It actually works. And my impression was that people just stopped doing that at some point. People just aren't politely asking for anything anymore. And I think that might explain some of the variation in outcome and, and of whether things are, are shared or not. So just keep it in mind. Uh, in any case, um, what this data is going to allow me to do, uh, I essentially, I'm working with scientists. So um, that's that's my shtick. Uh, and, uh, the weird situation is that uh, we are already working on stuff, and um, when it comes to WikiLeaks, uh, it's not even clear yet whether these scientists uh, can have their names appear on any of the results that are coming out. Because not so much because they're worried about themselves, although that is an issue, um, but a lot of them have undergraduate. This is the way science works. You, know, you have a team, uh, and some of those are 18-year-old kids, brilliant 18-year-old kids, who are doing incredible work with this data, but. No, you know, lab group leader in a university would uh, would ever just blithely uh, attach that person's name to a, a paper if it could tar their name for the rest of their career. It is currently illegal for any federal employee to even look at the data, even if it appears in the New York Times. Uh, so until we have clarity on that, um, it's it's not clear how this kind of collaboration is going to proceed. But it's very exciting. So yes, we hope you guys have a lot of questions. Um, when you ask your question, just uh, be sure to remember to uh, say your name for the recording. Thank you. 
And actually, as everyone's getting set up, um, I'll just um, say something that occurred to me as, as we were hearing all these amazing ideas. And I have to say my, my mind is very full because I'm very excited about um, all these different projects. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm interested in, in just sort of the future of the journalist as a as a person, as a um, you know, a part of sort of the, the general culture of journalism, and it seems like we're, we're seeing these new models emerge. We have the sort of the old model of, you know, the solitary reporter, um, you know, very tenaciously and passionately um, and solitarily uh, following a story, um, and then we have the very um, networked and collaborative model of a lot of different people, um, a lot of different sort of points on a grid working together and creating journalism as a unit. Um, and there's no real sense of authorship in that. It's more of a collective endeavor. And then we have something in the middle, which is you know, the, the sort of connected reporter who is fundamentally a solitary presence and an author in a very traditional sense, um, and yet networked and, and using a network um, um, in, in a very traditional way, but also in a very sort of uh, newfangled way. And one of the things that um, occurred to me as, as we were hearing our panelists talk was Jay Rosen's uh, definition of, of what journalism is for. Um, and to paraphrase it, it's basically uh, narrating the world in a way that encourages participation in it. And I think that's a very useful uh, sort of framing of, of what journalism is and what it's becoming. So um, I'll just throw that out there as a framing mechanism as we're getting everyone barred. Is everyone good to go? All right, so questions from the audience? Yeah. Stephanie, please. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm interested in, you didn't say how it was that you discovered, I'm sorry, I'm afraid, but I'm just curious to see, how did you discover that that study in The Lancet was incorrect? What was your methodology that was success that you say is successful? Yeah. How do you know it's, who declared it successful? So uh, I was just thinking about that. At, uh, I was like, well, maybe I took that too far. The, the really, the, the best thing to say is that the, the scientific community has widely uh, dismissed that study. Um, there are so many, it has so many problems at so many levels, but here's an obvious one. Um, their published methodology um, for how you choose which houses on whose doors to knock um, uh, was unrepresentative of the total layout of streets in, the, in, in Iraq, and that was plainly visible using Google Maps mm -hmm. and Google Earth. You said you were embedded over there to do... Oh, I was never in Iraq. Oh. I was in Afghanistan. Uh, well, okay, uh, Afghanistan. How, what was your methodology to... You said you were there to ter make that similar determination? No, ma'am. I was there to get data on civilian casualties. From the military. From both the UN and the military and, and NGOs. It's been a long process. Thank you. Stephanie? Okay. I have a question for Aaron. Okay. Um, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'd like to sort of explain a little bit more. I think you were a bit short. You said you talked about WikiLeaks being the Napster and sort of the process that's going on from sort of, you know, everything being on one server to everything being everywhere. But where does it lead us with? sort of the questions about journalism that we're trying to raise today. So I, I didn't, I think in my attempt not to get the hook uh, off the stage here, I might have been a little imprecise in what I meant by Napster and so forth. I, I'm not actually saying that BitTorrent at the technology is the future. I'm saying that distributed is the future. And already there is an organization called OpenLeaks that is derived from a former partner of Julian, of, of somebody who used to be involved with WikiLeaks that, while I have to say it's sort of hard to get a sense of what their actual, how the technology is actually going to work, um, it feels a lot more distributed in the sense of where this content is going to go and who is actually going to be involved and what the role of the organization is going to be than WikiLeaks itself, which was very much a funnel coming in and very much a funnel going out. And this feels like it's actually going to be an organization that will basically funnel two different nodes, which will be news organizations, potentially, watchdog groups, who knows what. And then from there, it will, the information will be disseminated. So I think that, and just specifically in the context of using technology to um, uh, facilitate the leaking of documents and data and, and getting that into the public consciousness in an, in an anonymous way. Uh, we heard, I mean, we all know that, that we do, frankly, 
a, a terrible job protecting whistleblowers. I mean, whistleblowers are very much, um, uh, you, 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 uh, it, it is a risk when you, when you um, non-anonymously leak a document. So uh, the, I think the technology solution to that is going to be closer to a distributed system like a BitTorrent um, than a very centralized system like, like WikiLeaks. That's what I was getting at. David. Uh, can, you, can you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Thanks. <coughs> Maggie Mulvihill. Thanks. From the New England Center for Investigative Reporting. Um, and David, we, we work with CPI sometimes. So I was asked about, um, you know, the future of nonprofit investigative journalism entities on the local level. And one of the ways that we're flourishing here, anyway, is uh, because journalism schools, I think, in a lot, a lot of ways, are stepping up to the plate and saying, we have a role to play in the in the transformation. And I wondered what um, was happening on the international level with journalism schools abroad. Are they, uh, do you have any sense that they're <coughs> getting more involved in supporting reporters in their country as foreign bureaus are closed? I just wondered if you knew much about that. that that's a great question. Uh, I did a, a survey, uh, I think it was in 07, with the Center for International Media Systems, where we, um, we identified 40 uh, centers around the world, and there's probably 60 now. Um, uh, you guys didn't even exist then, I, I, I think. And uh, there's really been a mushrooming here, here in the States. Uh, and and we, we got back uh, more than 30 responses. I, I can't quite remember, but it, it was a substantial number, about a quarter, I think, had some relationship with the university. Uh, and, and if you go back, if you look at IRE, and you know the, the, the largest association of investigative journalists in, in, in the world, I think there's about 4,000 members, um, they would not exist, I think, without a university affiliation. The University of Missouri has been key to giving them free labor, office space, uh, uh, logistical support, and, and it's, it's really helped us spread this thing worldwide because we had such a strong parent organization here, here in the the states, and they've used this model all over the world. It, 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 not just formally, but informally. You'll find that, that the journalists who are staffing these centers, and a lot of them are just like two or three people, uh, they're also teaching on the side. So even, even if there's not a formal relationship, it's helping, uh, teaching is helping subsidize this, and the students come as interns, and it's, it's, it's just a great feed-in uh, uh, process. Where the real challenge is, because is most of these centers are a drop in the bucket. I mean, you think about how many jobs we've lost here, and all these new centers are less than a thousand staff that, that that we've created, and and you know it just it can't possibly make up for for the loss we've suffered. Now, what do we do in developing countries, in places like Africa that have journalism schools from like a century ago? That that the curriculum is is ancient and bureaucratic, and and <coughs> there's just so much work to do. But this is a great model for, for how to do it, involving you know, the, the most progressive parts of, of academia and fusing them with nonprofits and foundation funding and, and revenue generating like, like you guys are doing. Talk about that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yep, in the corner. I had a question. Uh, Barb Simon Davy from NECIR. For Bill Allison, the Sunlight Foundation, yes. I recently saw um, stateoftheusa.org, there was a presentation on it which seems to be a government-funded um, site that's trying to put everything you could think of up on the web in a way that citizens can access it. And I'm wondering what you're doing is related to that or not. Are you collaborating with them, or are you even aware of them? I am aware of them. Uh, State of the USA, though, and I, my, and forgive me if I got this wrong, I think they've somewhat, um, they haven't really built it out in the way that they want to, and I think that there's, uh, this was a government Initiative where they were hoping to get a lot of nonprofit support or foundation support, and I don't think the foundation support uh, has quite materialized the way that they would want it, owing to the economy. Um, I think, though, that the, that you know, I know what they're trying to do is look for real, um, I don't know, the equivalent of economic indicators across the board for like how is education doing, how is health doing, how is, and what they're looking for is kind of national metrics. What Sunlight is looking at and uh, in terms of data, I mean, we're very much focused on, uh, in some ways, on local data. Um, we're looking for, you know, if you're a reporter in or a citizen in Philadelphia, what can you come to get 
uh, what kind of information can you get about your community? And there's a tremendous amount of federal data that has a lot of local uh, applicability. And that's what, you know, that's sort of what we're looking at now. The other thing that we're trying to do is to enhance data as much as we can by bringing in information from other sources and not just rely solely on government data. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes this is like Center for Responsive Politics and what they do with cleaning up campaign finance records. Sometimes it's going to a private vendor to find, um, you know, uh, better information on the sale of pharmaceuticals than, say, you can get from ResDAC or you can get from the government providers. So I think Sunlight's, um, you know, Sunlight isn't just looking for a report card for the country. We're looking for much more granular data and much more data that's much more can be used for stories and reporting and much more on an individual basis. Um, yep, uh, first, uh, second row and then third row. Mm -hmm. Your second row. Thank you. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Paul Knox from Toronto. So a uh, couple of things. Megan, you mentioned this whole idea of um, is individual authorship disappearing or transmuting in some way, and I, I've been thinking about that too. And it gets to a little bit what John is talking about, a little bit what John is talking about, and I can see some potentially good things, such as the more authors you have, the harder it is to figure out who the author was, uh, in the sense that John was talking about fingerprinting documents. On the other hand, who is responsible for the result, uh, and who's going to stand up and defend it? in these collaborative projects, or is it logical that everybody is going to have the same level of buy-in um, if the solids hit the fan and it becomes really controversial and something has to be um, defended? Um, the other thing is, um, thinking about what John had to say about you know the, the fact that there's probably a whole lot of people thinking right now about how can we fingerprint stuff so we know you can never wipe out the connection to who did it. What about the actual, what about, are they also thinking about, do we actually need documents? Do we actually need to be producing as many documents as we produce? I mean, bureaucracies produce massive numbers of documents and they replicate one another now because of, partly because of technology. Uh, they proliferate in ways they never used to proliferate. Is it conceivable that people are going to be thinking, well, do we, why are we putting up, why are we writing this stuff, all this stuff down? We should go back to oral history. If all we're, <laughs> if all we're going to be doing is giving our enemies the tools to use against us. Um, and I'm just wondering if any of the panelists have any thoughts about whether any of that might be in the future as well. I don't know how you're going to get around the need for documents. Um, also, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. I'm no expert, but uh, I, this, at the very beginning of this whole conference, someone <coughs> sort of uh, complained about the fact, or referenced a complaint, that there are so many classified, classified documents, and there's so many people who have top secret clearance, as if that's a problem. I, that, I, there probably is a lot of problems, but I don't see that being the problem, because people forget that just because you have top secret, secret clearance doesn't mean you have access to all top secret documents. There's another caveat called need to know basis, so top secret clearance simply means we've checked that guy out, uh, you know, he's not a terrorist. I'm not surprised there are 800,000 people who meet that criterion. But so the, I think the number I mean, was just 3 million. To, yeah, to set the record straight, I mean, the, even the head of the Federation, what they call the Federation of Scientists, um, has brought this up as an issue because there has been so much clear that this is an aftermath of 2001 when there was too little collaboration in, right. that, in, the, in the sort of workings with that lots more of classified information has been made available to a larger, much larger number of people. Mm -hmm. And the numbers actually vary. I've seen from 1 million to 3 million. So, you know, we'll, we'll find out over time what the facts are. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a lot of scientists in D.C. who are making the argument that the same argument that Bill Keller made about, you know, a lot of classified information doesn't make it any easier for you to keep your classified information. Yeah, absolutely. You just need to turn the dial down uh, for the threshold between classification levels. Yeah. The class classification system itself, I don't know how you could do without it. It works. Clint, did you have a comment on that? Well, yeah, I was just going to say that actually um, I, I wouldn't agree the classification system works. In, in one, um, it's, it's just massively mismanaged and massively dysfunctional. One measure of that is that um, we actually don't know how many people have classification 
access. That's classified. It's not classified. They just don't know. They oh. can't count it. Um, you ask the authorities. Uh, you know, there's an office of the National Archives that tries to look at it. They don't exactly know. Um, uh, I forget which uh, House subcommittee asked just last week. Can we get a number? And the answer was no. Sorry, we, we can't figure it out. <coughs> that doesn't work. It doesn't sound like it works to me. Mm -hmm. What's that? The first part is in continuity. Sure, yeah, do you guys have a thought on that? Thank you. On, on sort of the you idea of us. singular authorship <laughs> versus distributed authorship and, and what that means for accountability for, for journalists. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> I, I was looking at you, Aaron. I thought you'd be good on it. Oh, no, we are the masters of singular authorship, so I'm not really. <laughs> I'm, I'm also not, not quite that. sure what the question, yeah. sort of where it go, gets to, because in Germany, we have a long history of no author on the story. It's the publication that holds the responsibility on the, the news yeah. organization, sorry, that holds the responsibility that publishes the story. It was actually a huge step that is attributed to US individualism that now in Germany you have bylines in your article. Right, so but those are but those are established organizations, they're incorporated companies. They're so but what are we talking legal, about then? But, well, but you still have to you have know, collaborative projects that don't have such a well defined um, corporate existence. Like Wikipedia, Institution, for example. Institutional existence. Although even Wikipedia well, um, has a, a very sort of traceable um, authorship story, I, I think. But yeah, to, no, exactly. just, I don't know. No, but I, I, I think it is a good question because I, I think, I mean, we just see in, in sort of our everyday, li everyday lives, basically, that, you know, the more, uh, the more atomized these things become and the more, you know, the more people are involved. Well, no, um, there, there's a philosoph some people hold the philosophical view that it's better to have a text that keeps getting modified by everybody's contribution to it. That's how knowledge is built, rather than by a whole bunch of people making individual identifiable contributions for which they can be accountable, account, held accountable. I mean, this is a view that's out there, you know, and I, I, you know, I personally think it's a view that's problematic, but maybe I'm wrong, you know. But I mean, a lot of people say, well, you know, I mean, this, this is kind of the, uh, I mean, it's a little bit the Wikipedia phenomenon, you know, we, one person says something and a whole bunch of people jump in and modify it, maybe they're right, maybe they're not so right, but there's a philosophy out there that eventually that's the way you get to a closer version of the truth than you do if one person just pontificates, so, and, and even on the basis of investigation, you know, that, that, and, and I guess um, I see a little bit of that in uh, in in some of the in some of these new projects, for example, Hera's uh, project. I mean, what's what's true about what's on there? You know, how much of it's how much of it's uh, you know how 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 much of it's uh, it, it, is there an addition to collective knowledge there, or is it more the experience that um, uh, that you're offering the audience for that project? I, I, it's an interesting point. I, I think when you, you get into more sensitive areas, when you're talking about national security information or you're making criminal allegations against individuals or groups, the legal community is going to have a, a voice here. And, and just like uh, 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 people found when they pass around uh, bits of, of music or other intellectual property, there can be consequences. You can't just get out there and make <coughs> allegations. There, there's a trail that, that uh, you know, some people are very skilled at following. Even on Wikipedia, there's a trail to who's, who, who's, who's, you know, filing these things. And you just can't make wild allegations out there. I mean, things do go viral and, 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 and of course, get out there. But if you're talking about something more structured where you're actually making, you know, kind of an indictment <coughs> against, against something, I, I don't think that's going to change, certainly not in places where you have rule of law. Um, I, I think it'd be a lot of trouble for, for individuals who are out there throwing stuff to see what, what sticks. There's also a vulnerability, just to throw one more, more idea your way, to uh, the many authors approach, which is that it's, uh, let's say you're the US government and you know that there's a big dump coming, and uh, you could generate an even bigger dump of close but not quite right facsimiles. You could flood the system with sort of uh, different versions of the same thing. And if it's a distributed system, there's no one Assange who says, yep, this is the real deal and here it is. If it's just a, it's out there in, in BitTorrent, how do you know which one's the real McCoy? You sort of, you throw up your hands. And that's exactly what the record companies did, by the way. <laughs> Jonathan, did you have a comment on that? Uh, no, on something else. Is that, okay. Um, <laughs> let, let me actually, I said that the gentleman in the black over here would go oh. first and then, and then we'll move on over to this side. 
Thank you. Uh, James Miller from the Media Lab. This is actually kind of a follow-up. Uh, John, you made the interesting point. Right? I, you drew an analogy between science and journalism. Uh, I wish you'd elaborate on that a little bit. And I wonder if, um, if we accept that analogy, whether that model is at odds with Aaron's view of the BitTorrent future. Uh, these seem like very different ways of thinking about journalism. Can they coexist? Sure. I mean, I they are. <laughs> well, I didn't want to go further than to simply say the values and many of the techniques of good investigative journalism are actually um, <coughs> symmetric with sci the same thing as science. I agree with that. And, and that just means you come at the problem without a preconceived story. You don't say, this is, you know, I'm going to pad numbers to this story that I've already decided. Um, you let the data tell the story. Um, you always share the basis of your claims. Um, there is no such thing as, uh, you know, trust me. Um, you have to show essentially where you're coming from. And uh, I don't know, it, there's also this kind of value thing where you are by definition working with everyone else to try and get to the truth. And this is the assumption that there is something out there called the truth, and that's not always clearly the case, but I think 90, 95% of the time it is. If I can just add to that, and if you think of the BitTorrent model, I mean, one of the things that you're always doing when you're a reporter is looking for sources and looking for people who have information, and suddenly you have those people not hiding under rocks or uh, hiding in the basement of the Pentagon, putting out information themselves, then that makes your job that much easier <coughs> if you have that kind of distributed information. I mean, obviously you still have to do the reporting and the verification, the accuracy, but it becomes much easier when everybody is a publisher uh, to find <coughs> out information. And the reason I'm even, I even raised BitTorrent as part of this conversation is to get past, I, I mean, there's a lot of conversation about whether WikiLeaks is good or bad, whether Julian Assange is good or bad, whether we've eliminated the problem by putting him in jail or whatever. And to me, that's kind of like debating gravity. It is, right? The, the idea is there. This is where we're headed. It's really not, I mean, we can talk about it, and it's, that's, that's valid. But more important, I think, is to recognize that this is going to become a way in which reporters need or will be receiving content, and it's not just you know, traditional reporters, um, all of us. So, you know, it's a reality. But if I may, science is about very vigorous rules and collaboration according to certain standards of testing and so forth. BitTorrent is like, you know, throw it all out there. Right. right. So when you raise questions about verification and accuracy in that environment. But I would never say that BitTorrent, I'm sorry to interrupt, no, but I would never claim that the mere publishing of a database, whether that's publishing just to a news organization or to the world is in fact an act of journalism. I, I would say that that's dis distributing raw material which then can be analyzed and synthesized and turned into an act of journalism, but I would never make the claim that that in and of itself is journalism. And I actually, in that sense, I would say that probably, though it's kind of an academic question, I know I'm here, so that's a it's good okay. thing, um, but it's an academic question of whether WikiLeaks is or isn't a news organization. I would say that, this, that WikiLeaks is a does some journalistic things. Journalists take, you know, we provide a venue where people who want to leak a document or uh, give us a tip, they can do that. That's kind of what we do. But WikiLeaks is a distribution channel. It's a, it's a way of distributing that. And that's, that's really not just, that's not all the journalists do, obviously. And by the way, science has plenty of things like this. I mean, there's enormous amounts of data that's just floating around on, on servers and scientists' computers that they're sharing all the time. It's a very similar process. Like the internet, for example, which was internet. originally designed. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Jonathan? And then Kevin, right after him? Right. Um, yes. So we've had a, a lot of um, discussion about secrecy of government. I'm wondering about secrecy of news organizations. Someone made the comment that <laughs> yes. think, uh, a journalist's rights has to be backed up with some sort of evidence. But, but oftentimes, that actually doesn't happen. So I'm wondering. Uh, you, Aaron, have uh, built a document system so journalists can share their source material. Uh, have you gotten any resistance to the idea that journalists should put up what they write from? Well, I mean, the resistance usually comes not through an act of commission, usually it's an act of omission. In other words, uh, journalists will just simply decide not to share, and, and that's definitely a problem. Um, I, part of the reason document, you know, we created Document Cloud is for exactly what you're, what you're, I, I did not plant this question, 
This is a, 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 a yeah, nicely done. Uh, uh, this is one of these. This is one of the stated goals of this project is to encourage journalists to be more transparent about their reporting. To say not only this is what we believe. Here's the document and the actual paragraph, the significant point, and we're going to actually annotate this and and say here is the significance of it and why we believe what we believe. But yes, here you go. Here is the whole thing. If you think we're wrong, call us on it. You know. So I guess. I wasn't sure that people would actually use this. So we started with a smaller version at the Times, and that kind of blew up in the document cloud. To my surprise, reporters at the Times have actually used it quite a bit. A lot of our investigative reporters have used it. We did a big, Michael Moss just did a great series on, on cheese, of all things. It's not really on cheese, but it's about cheese. And, and published a bunch, go, go look it up, it's a good series. And, um, um, uh, and he published a bunch of documents that are, that are really critical, the, the Las Vegas Sun has been doing an ongoing series during the year. And part of the, the stated reason they're using Document Cloud is to not only show their work, but to show the, 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 the potential lawyers who may be coming after them for the series that they're doing, say, hey, here's, here's what you're going to be up against. You know, If you want to take us to the court, here is what you're going to be up against. Um, so to me, it's journalistic transparency is, is 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 core to moving into this sort of digital future where you're talking about this kind of data everywhere, you know, everybody's a journalist sort of environment. To me, it's all about journalistic transparency because that's all we've got. If if we don't have trust, if people don't trust what we're doing, if we can't point to, to uh, show our work like we did in algebra class, so show how we got from A to B, then we're not. We are going to sink. We're going to absolutely sink. And it's going to be impossible for people to tell the difference between good journalism and um, supposition, guesswork, whatever you want to call it. But it's, it's one of the great things about how, how the web has, has changed publishing, in effect, because we can put all these documents out, out there, and we, we, can, we can put the, 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 the database. People can download the spreadsheets. I, I think there, there are legal questions. That, that, that will come up, you know, not only you know, th does that protect us, but then if we put everything out there, does that expose people that we need to, to, to protect? I mean, I, 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 can, I can already hear conversation with counsel going on. You know, you're not putting that online, I'm sorry. Right. So, so there, there are those concerns. Thanks, Kevin. I'll ask a question. Uh, how large is the audience for, for one-eighth base <coughs> track? I'm sorry? How, how large is the audience for one-eighth um, base track? And also, he says it's an experiment, but what do you hope comes of that experiment at the very end? You know, if there is an end, what is the, the, the aim of it? Well, maybe a way of getting to that is um, uh, during the midterm elections, the New York Times did a, did a poll of voters to see uh, where <coughs> Afghanistan and the war uh, fit in in their priorities. So 3% said that it was their top priority. I think uh, something like 73% said that they weren't even really following the war. So the 3%, guessing who they are isn't very difficult. That's, I think, the immediate network that surrounds the less than 1% that actually serves in the military. So the core audience of this one uh, for this project is very small. It's about 2,000 people, I would say. Um, but they're incredibly active. and. Uh, that what I'm wondering, the experiment that I, I'd like to see is what is the ripple effect in a social media context? <coughs> what is that social graph? How many people can a thousand Marines and their, the 2,000 people who are logging in every day to learn about them, how far can that go? Great, thanks. Oh, please go ahead. Would you like it to be more widely seen? Um, yeah, and basically, that's where we go now. I mean, I, I'm going back on Monday um, to Afghanistan, and I'm bringing a writer with me, a blogger, actually, from a, a technology blog. It's called Gizmodo, and it's kind of wildly popular with, uh, I think, 20 to 30-year-olds who are really into gadgets and gear. And, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's going to inject a very different um, audience into, into, into the stream. Um, and we're going to be doing as much of that as we can, basically trying to uh, disrupt the gene pool and see what, what, what comes out of that. I also had a question for you. Uh, did you ever consider including their pic 
from the soldier's own snaps in it. And what are they doing? If, if in the end they're communicating with their families, uh, I was wondering, and what's the mm -hmm. policy of the of the higher command? Um, yeah, one of the reasons uh, uh, also behind the project was that um, the uh, U.S. Marine Corps very recently changed their policy on social media, mm -hmm. meaning that Marines are now al uh, allowed to access social media sites like Facebook and Twitter on government computer systems. They um, yeah, they are. But um, on a local level, uh, commanders still have the discretion you know, to uh, implement that or not, depending on how they feel about it. And it seems like quite a lot of the local commanders don't want the Marines um, logging into Facebook. And beyond that, under this counterinsurgency approach, um, a key piece of that was pushing troops off these super bases where they would have you know, internet and all, and all, and all that. Um, so what's happening in Afghanistan now is very different than what was going on in the last few years of Iraq where you had troops concentrated on these massive bases of where they would literally have uh, personal personal uh, Ethernet lines uh, to their computers, and they could access the, the internet every day. Um, these Marines are out in tiny, tiny positions uh, without running water or electricity. You know, sleeping on cots in the open. There's no internet for them, so that actually didn't become uh, an option. And what are they doing with their own pictures? Do they send them to their families all the time when they can? Um, well, again, they have very little capacity to do that, um, especially if they're deployed in one of these small outposts. Right in the middle here. Hi, uh, yeah. I'm Jason Framus with Open Media Boston. Um, and I guess I'll direct this to uh, uh, Taro and John, because um, you've both been uh, embedded in some <laughs> sense as reporters or as a scientist, you said. Uh, but it's open to the whole panel. Um, if we agree that transparency is a virtue in a democratic society, right? for public institutions, private institutions, and NGOs. Um, can the cause of transparency, and I don't mean this as sharply as it may sound, um, can the cause of transparency be served by embedded reporters? Um, you know, it's a, it's a, this is like a neologism that was invented by the Department of Defense, embedded reporter. I mean, it's something that when I was coming up as a reporter in the 80s, we never would have considered doing. When I was in the Middle East, I'm not going to ask anybody's permission to go cover, you know, a bomb bus or wherever I was doing, you know. Um, so what do y'all think? Well, first, first of all, I learned something. I, I, before I went, I thought exactly the way you did, uh, that embed <coughs> is just a neologism, and it's just like, you know, even using it is kind of playing into a kind of, uh, I don't know, yeah. But uh, it turns out to mean something slightly different than just having permission to go and cover a story. Um, the guys I was staying with were actually AP reporters, um, AP photographers doing um, medevac, Teams and when when you're embedded in a particular team, you're actually expected to, in uh, you know, in a pinch, do a job. You actually are sort of you have to kind of carry your weight in some situations, um, and that's not something that's expected of, of journalists traditionally. So it, it's a bit more complicated than just okay, we you are embedded. So that was a surprise to me actually, but. Uh, yeah, I, I was consciously aware that maybe I was being biased uh, just by all these friendly people saving my life. Um, I absolutely agree, and I'm, I, don't, I only half joke when I say that. I mean, it's, it's a concern. Like, God, how, how, after they saved my life, can, how can I criticize them fairly? That kind of thing. Um, I felt like I wasn't um, the most vulnerable to that kind of bias because of the nature of the story I'm doing. I'm doing a story about data, and the data will speak for itself. So. It's not. Do you trust the data too? Well, is what I'm asking. Oh, I'm, I'm going to interrogate the data. Yeah. Um, well, I don't even know what the word neologism means, so <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll skip over that part. You know what? It means a new word. It is itself a neologism. <laughs> but um, sorry. <laughs> embedding. Um, I mean, the only thing that's new about that is is the word embed. That's the way wars have been covered forever. Yeah from time immemorial. Um, there are, I wouldn't say people, well, okay, just, I, I, go ahead. And I'm not saying it's the only way to uh, report, um, but there are places like southern Afghanistan uh, where uh, there's no bed and breakfast that you can stay <laughs> in. And, uh, um, 
you know, unless you got your own helicopters and, and, and a way to find water in a desert, all that stuff, um, your, your opportunities to, to travel independently are pretty limited. So uh, <coughs> I actually think that uh, embedding, I think, I think it becomes a problem when it's the only perspective, uh, because it is a very limited perspective. But the conduct of US military operations in Afghanistan are not an insignificant part of how this all plays out. So I actually think uh, it's a very good thing. Um, I think the problem with embedded journalism, by and large, isn't the embedding. It tends to be the journalists who, in many cases, just don't know what they're looking at. <coughs> well, I'm also asking about transparency. Because like the project that you're doing now, right, mm -hmm. isn't, isn't just really journalism. It's kind of ideally helping give us a, a pers better perspective of what the military is doing on the ground in a large way, right? It, it would, of course, be nice to see what Afghanis are doing on the ground, too. That would be a lot harder. But I mean, so it's, it's, it's a, it is a data question as well. I mean, it's like, are we getting information that people in the US can use to make decisions about war and peace here, right? Um, you know, that's trustworthy. Or is, you know, is it always, must we always fear PR spin? Yeah, you must always feel, feel fear PR spin, but that's not a, a dynamic that's isolated to the military. I've embedded with Tibetan monks and uh, you know, bloods and crypts. Every every kind of um, experience where you immerse yourself in some group or some culture is it's the same dynamics. You become close to them, and uh, you have to uh, work hard to to maintain your objectivity. Thank you. And did we have a question in the back? Oh, yes. Yep. Um, you said you mentioned most of your audience um, get most of their news from Fox News. That's what I was told by yeah. the commanders of the. Okay. So, what kind of news do you, what, what sources of news do you, do you put on your news feed? Mm -hmm. Like, is it an analysis or a report or just from what's going on? Or? Well, there's and, a. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. And do the military try to influence what you put on that? If, if your audience is getting most of the news from Fox News, like, do they influence what you're putting on there in case they get another point of view? Um, well, first, you know, I couldn't swear that, that, that Fox News is the only news source that, that uh, everybody um, uh, watches. That's just what I was told by one of the commanders of, the, of this battalion. But um, there's a news feed on the website, which is, um, it's, it's basically just scraping. Originally, we were um, just having it randomly search, you know, anything with Afghanistan in it. Um, and it was pulling out. Um, you know, a very wide range of stuff, some of it uh, less reputable than others. So we, we ended up um, uh, giving it specific um, sources to draw from, um, but they're certainly not Fox News. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a much wider uh, uh, stream of sources, including, say, newspapers from Pakistan and Afghanistan, um, and a lot of international um, news organizations. Um, there was a second part of the question I forgot. Is it quite general? As in, the military don't try to influence what you put on there in terms of it might maybe influencing the opinions of the, the families and loved ones of the people, the battalion? I've heard some complaints that, um, that, uh, that the news that's coming out seems very negative. Um, to which I've said, you know, hey, sorry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I wish there was more good news, but. Uh, <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you. On that note, thank you very much to the panelists. Yes. And thanks to you guys for all the questions.